It all began with a call. With Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla urging on the people of New Spain to fight for their independence. But history unfolds for a reason. Several events in Europe and America lead up to Father Hidalgo's call. The winds of freedom are sweeping through the world. A war of independence is being fought in the United States to free itself of England. And the French Revolution seeks to cast off the tyranny of the king. These wars reaffirm the right of all people to fight for their freedom, for equality, and the right to elect their own governments. In 1808, Napoleon Bonaparte invades Spain and takes Charles IV and King Ferdinand VII as prisoners. This unleashes a war against the French and brings instability to the Spanish colonies. At this time, New Spain is the Spanish Empire's most prosperous territory, but its wealth benefits the Spanish crown more than it benefits the colony itself, which angers those who live there. Several clandestine groups form to begin the independence movement. One of these conspiracies sets off the war. The meetings of Miguel Hidalgo, Ignacio Allende, Juan Aldama, and Josefa Ortiz de Dominguez in Querétaro are discovered. Hidalgo goes to the church in the town of Dolores and calls on the people to overthrow the government of New Spain. With a standard of the Virgin of Guadalupe as their flag, the rebels win their first victories over the troops loyal to the king, which are defeated in the bloody battle at the public granary, the Alondiga de Granaditas in Guanajuato. The rebels are unstoppable on their march to Mexico City, but after the Battle of Monte de las Cruces on the outskirts of the capital, Hidalgo decides to retreat despite his victory there. The independence forces occupy Guadalajara. There, they try to organize a government. They start a newspaper, El Despertador Americano, and they proclaim the abolition of slavery. But royalist forces under the command of Felix Maria Calleja follow in close pursuit. The two armies engage in combat outside of Guadalajara in the Battle of Calderon Bridge, where the rebels suffer their worst defeat. Fleeing north, Hidalgo, Allende, Mariano Jimenez, and Juan Aldama are ambushed and taken prisoners in Acatita de Baján, Coahuila. Later, they are tried and executed in Chihuahua. After the death of Hidalgo, another parish priest takes command, Jose Maria Morelos y Pavón. The high point of his military career is breaking the siege of Cuautla, where 7,000 of Calleja's troops had kept Morelos and 3,000 rebels under siege for 72 days. In addition to his military genius, Morelos is a visionary who seeks to provide the new country with a political organization. He assembles the Congress of Anahuac and reads there a document entitled Sentiments of the Nation. In Apatzingán, Congress adopts Mexico's first constitution, which establishes the country's political structure and a division of powers into the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. But soon after, Morelos begins to lose his battles. In 1815, he is taken prisoner, tried, and executed. In 1817, the independence movement was losing momentum when a liberal Spaniard, Javier Mina, gave it new impetus by arriving in Mexico with 300 men to fight with the rebels. After a bold campaign, he is trapped and shot in the back, accused of betraying his homeland. An event in 1820 changes the course of history. Spanish King Ferdinand VII accepts a liberal constitution, which eliminates many of the political, economic, and social privileges enjoyed by the Spaniards living in the colonies. This accelerates the move towards independence in Mexico. Creoles, Spaniards, Mestizos, the indigenous population, and other elements of society all fight for the same goal, although for different reasons. The War of Independence ends when Vicente Guerrero, the most well-known rebel, and Agustin de Iturbide, a Creole at the head of the Royalist Army, seal a pact with the embrace of Acatempa. With the Plan of Iguala, or the Plan of the Three Guarantees, Iturbide proclaims the independence of Mexico. After 11 years of fighting and three centuries of domination by Spain, Mexico emerges as an independent nation. 
history belongs to everyone. Bicentennial of independence. Centennial of the Mexican Revolution. The Mexican government. Okay, I just had to show you that. That's the Mexican government has been preparing for Mexican, Mexico's bicentennial. It's also the centennial of the revolution this year as well. And we'll be talking about that in November on the uh, anniversary of the revolution beginning in, on November 20th, approximately. Uh, the government, of course, leaves a lot out, and that's, that is the official story in the way. There, a lot of the details, as you can guess, are not in that government um, uh, video, and including a lot of stuff that they would rather not remember. So what we are looking at today is not to put down the beginnings of this, but to look at the, the real beginnings of, of Mexico's independence and to wonder, you know, just to answer the question as I was asked right before the presentation, why is it that we sometimes celebrate it on the 15th and sometimes on the 16th? Does anybody know the answer to that? <laughs> That's what people think. The cry of independence actually was somewhere between four and eight o'clock in the morning. I, I have one. Yes. Uh, for Phil, he was born in 1515, so he celebrated in 1514. Extra credit. You got it, yes. The, the, the dictator of Mexico in the, the late 19th century, early 20th century, Porfirio Diaz, discovered that, the, that a Greek saint called St. Porfirio's uh, feast day was the 15th of, of September, and so they began to celebrate it uh, a year, a day early. And it's become so common that people, they, the official uh, celebration has been moved to midnight for that reason. Because so many, so many years in Mexico they celebrated on the 15th that they literally uh, moved it to the midnight to try to cover both days. So, yes, but you can turn on your television tonight and at midnight there will be a celebration that begins with the, the grito as it's called, the, the, the reenactment of the call by the president of Mexico in the Zocalo, the big square of Mexico City, which will be on, should be on all Spanish television stations tonight. If you've never seen it, you should take a look at it or at least catch it tomorrow when the news reports that. Uh, what you see on here, of course, is you see the uh, uh, a cartoon that was supposed to have been uh, released today, uh, the uh, uh, Héroes Verdadores, uh, Verdadores, about, uh, Verdadores, Verdadores, uh, True Heroes, and it's supposed to be out, but, but like many things in Mexico with the celebration, it's not on time. And the, the government's been having serious problems, including as well the filmmakers, and so uh, look for that in a theater near you sometime soon. Now, the, the background to this, which they, they didn't really talk much about, but we're, we're gonna cover it a little bit here. The Mexican history is very, relatively easy to uh, compartmentalize. Uh, the, the conquest of the, by the Spanish took place in 1521, at least of the Aztecs, and independence comes in 1821, so there's a nice th round 300 years, that's easy to remember, the beginnings and the end. But over th there's 300 years of colonial rule, and the, uh, Mexico was an established colony long before the English showed up on the shores to establish the colonies that would eventually become the United States. In this system, it had been built for the benefit of the Spanish. All the power, all the privileges, all the best positions uh, would go to people who are called peninsular Spanish, people born in Spain. And they're also known as gachupines, uh, those who wear spurs. It's kind of a, kind of a put-down word that they use for them. They would have called themselves peninsulares in Spanish. But the, the other people would have called them ga, uh, gachupines. They were a small percent of the population, maybe less than 100,000 out of 6 million, in, certainly in 1820. Below them were the Creole Spanish. Uh, Creole is a term meaning uh, European in America, or and uh, in Spanish criollos. But they they would, for the purpose of this lecture, we'll call them Creoles. Although they were Spanish, 100% pure Spanish, whatever that was, they were second-class citizens. They had they could be appointed to positions of a priest or or to a local town council or something, but they couldn't be a bishop. They couldn't be the viceroy, which was the, the king's representative. They couldn't be uh, any of the higher officials in the church or in government. Those were reserved for Peninsular Spanish. And they resented that. Uh, we often think independence is fought to free the people, but no, this was about the Creoles. The entire event was about the Creoles. You, what you see here is a painting from the Museum of Independence which shows the different levels of society. The Peninsular Spanish at the top under the crown, the church, the Hidalgos, the nobility, and then the below them other 
uh, Spanish, and then below those we have what are called the castas, and I will include something about this. Those, los de abajo, or those of the bottom, and below the Peninsular Spanish and the Creole Spanish, we had the, the castas, or the mixed, the mestizos. Uh, Mexico today is a mestizo nation. But during the colonial era, the Spanish had a complicated uh, array of terms to identify if you were part Spanish and part black, you were mulatto. If you were part Indian and part black, you were a castizo. If you were part uh, uh, European and part Indian, then you were a mestizo. And in, in the end, mestizo meant everything, but they had all these categories of racial classification. And um, this is just a small representation of the, of the paintings that they did to try to explain all of these things. The general levels of population below the Spanish were the, the castes, the castas, then the indigenous, the indios, the Indians, and then the black slaves. Well, the black slaves, of course, got the worst of everything. But um, generally, if you were an Indian or a black slave, you didn't really have many rights within the system. Although Indians were actually governed by a separate royal authority. But they made up the majority of the population, probably 80 to 85 percent of the population were not Spanish. And it's the same way, of course, today. As pointed out in the film, the short-term uh, catalyst in all of this is Napoleon. The, we like to think that an American, and including even in the little film here, because they knew it was headed for an English audience, that somehow the United States inspired Mexican independence, and that's simply not true. Uh, the United States and, uh, and the English-speaking world was a world completely different from the world of New Spain, as, as Mexico was once called, or the Spanish Empire. They were Protestant countries, and Spain was part of the Catholic world, and literally they were not on the radar, in, in much, much the way that things that happen in Africa are really not on our radar. We know it's there, but we don't pay much attention to it. And it was pretty much the same with what was going on in the Spanish world and what was going on in North America. They were aware that the colonies had overthrown the British with French help and that they had established themselves. And they thought that was interesting, but it was not something that people outside of few intellectuals were even concerned about because they're all heretics. They're all Protestants, so they weren't interested in them. So the United States is not the catalyst for this, although we like to think we're the catalyst for everything sometimes. But in fact, it was Napoleon coming out of the French Revolution, which was all, the, really a more a serious revolution than ours was in the, in the sense that it overturned a great parts of society. And Napoleon was one of the new men, the people who rose up under the old system, he would have been a nobody. And he rose up based on his abilities, which were military, of course, to become the, the leader of government, and eventually crowned himself emperor. Uh, so much for the French Revolution. He decided that he was going to prevent, the, his great enemy were the, was the British at this time, and he was preventing the British from trading with everybody in the continent of Europe, including countries that were not at war with the British. And the British were able to trade with Portugal, and he was mad at Portugal, and so he was going to invade Portugal, but to invade Portugal, you have to go through Spain. And so he invited the Spanish king, uh, Carlos IV, the, the one on the left, uh, to come and, and, and to talk to him just across the, front, the, the border in France. And Carlos is uh, not one of the better kings of, of Spain. Let's put it this way, he was, if he wasn't insane, he was at least incompetent. And his wife was so upset at him that she was having an affair with the head of the palace guards. And he was running the entire empire and selling off bishoprics and cardinal seats and, and uh, patents of royalty. Anybody with money could become royal or, or uh, nobility at that time because the, the, the Marcus de Pomboy and, and others uh, were in fact the, um, uh, uh, and other of these various new men were also controlling the kingdom. Many people in the Spanish Empire wanted his son to take over from him because they thought his father was insane. So Napoleon was smart about this. He invited both Carlos IV and his son, who would be Ferdinand VII, and their families to come and visit him. You know, please, as one monarch to the next. The Spanish had traditionally been the allies of the French, and usually not to their benefit during the wars, uh, the Napoleonic Wars and so on. But of course, as soon as they crossed the border, he imprisoned them for the rest of the war and put his own brother, uh, jo uh, Joseph Bonaparte, on the throne of Spain. He became Jose I. Now this is a problem for the Spanish colonies in the New World and around the world, who's in charge? Do you stay your loyal to Carlos IV? Well, nobody wanted to do that. Are you loyal to Ferdinand? Yes, maybe he'll be a really good king. 
So they, everybody wanted to be uh, loyal to Ferdinand VII. The, nobody was loyal to, to Jose I, except for the troops that were protecting him. In Spain, this started the first really uh, uh, guerrilla war. The word guerrilla warfare starts in Spain to oppose the French takeover of Spain in 1808. And you know it's still going on today. We, when we say guerrilla war, we know what we're talking about. But guerrilla means little war, and that's it was started by partisans in or insurgents, if you want to call them, in Spain at that time. So the American colonies did not want to recognize the French. After all, they'd been teaching in their in their churches that the French are atheists, that they are destroying true religion. We can't have that. And so to have a king under the control of the French, or to be French himself, is even worse. So there were a series of events to try to uh, uh, overthrow the Peninsular Spanish who wanted to keep control no matter who was in charge. And so they, they had actually had a conspiracy in Mexico City and, and the Viceroy had tried to go along with it but all the Spanish merchants and local no nobility got together and put them all in jail and de deposed the Viceroy. So we next move to the conspiracy of Querétaro, which is the one that is honored and remembered in the, in, in fact, they use the exact same uh, painting, which comes from the Museum of Independence in Dolores Hidalgo. And here we see the main characters that we'll come to in a minute. Do, uh, Miguel Dominguez, uh, the, the, the white-haired gentleman, and his wife, Maria Josefa de Ortiz, uh, they, he was the corregidor. This would be kind of a Spanish royal pos um, a position of kind of um, the mayor and police chief sort of rolled into one of the town of Querétaro, which today is a separate state in Mexico and it's a major city, a beautiful city that's a world heritage site and you should go and see it if you haven't seen it. Um, the, his wife, of course, uh, was uh, very involved in the discussions about independence. Also, two captains of the local militia, uh, Captains Allende on the left and Aldama on the right, and uh, somehow larger than life in this painting, as you can see, made much larger than the others, is Padre Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla, who is the father of Mexican independence. He's called the father of his country today. In America, we call him the George Washington of, of Mexico. I guess you could say George Washington is a Miguel Costilla, a Hidalgo y Costilla of, of the United States. He was uh, the, the padre of a, a nearby town of Dolores, which is where a lot of celebrations will take place tomorrow. He's an interesting character, and literally the symbol of the revolution, as you've seen from both the video and from uh, a lot of the uh, imagery that we have here. <coughs> You think that as a priest, he would be a circumspect man, but he wasn't. He was a man who loved life, like many of us. He, he had fathered several children. He had a regular series of mistresses. Uh, he gambled a lot. Um, he was a fun guy. Um, <laughs> he was, he was, uh, um, had been born in the Guanajuato area and had gone to the, the uh, Colegio San Nicolas and had gone ahead and been ma named rector of the college, actually. This is in modern, it was in Valladolid, which is Morelia today in Michoacan. And he uh, got caught fiddling with some of the funds. Maybe he was his gambling business, I don't know. But he, there was some statement about his funds handling that, that people were upset about. Plus, he'd also been known to go around and do things like scoff at the, the virginity of the Virgin Mary and that, the, that there was no hell and stuff like that, which is something that you don't do in a country that has the Spanish Inquisition to make sure that you are. And so the Inquisition hauled him in and they investigated him and either he had friends at the top or whatever, but he escaped that, but he lost his position at the, at the uh, Colegio and they moved him out to he, he, uh, Dolores, a small town in the nearby um, a territory of Guanajuato. And it's not exactly exile because Dolores is a pretty interesting place and it's close to the town of Guana, uh, Guanajuato today. Now Guanajuato was the richest place in the Spanish Empire at that time. More silver was coming out of there. It had been in Bolivia before that, but, but literally the silver mines in the, 17 and, uh, the late 1700s were just pouring out silver. When I visited there in 08 and 09, uh, the, the silver mines are still open and you can go into some of them. It's kind of interesting. And the, um, uh, the, so he's not too far, he's only 20, 20 miles away from there, so he can go in and have a party with the, the intendant, which is the royal official in Guanajuato, and he can talk about a variety of things, and they can, they can drink and gamble and do all the things that he likes to do. And you think, because he's not in Dolores, he's not doing that there. 
And, but he, when he came to Dolores, he decided that he was going to press his luck there too. And he began to uh, in, introduce things that the Spanish pr um, said you could not do in Mexico, like, like the silk production. He imported silkworms. He got people working on local um, uh, pottery making. In fact, uh, it's still going on. It's Talavera. Um, to Dolores uh, um, uh, in Guanajuato is where most of what we see as Talavera uh, pottery comes from in Mexico. It's not the original place, but it's where most of it that you can buy in the United States comes from to this very day. He also got them into wine production or growing grapes and stuff. And these were things under Spanish law that colonies were not allowed to do because the purpose of colonies is to buy stuff from Spain. And you know, send the gold and silver there, thank you, and then buy stuff from us. And they didn't want them to produce these things. But he just ignored that and went ahead. So he's certainly a man, uh, his own person, and he did what he thought was right. He got along very well with the local people because he, I'm sorry, because he could speak the language. Now many Spanish could not speak Nahuatl and Otomi and some of the other Indian languages, but he could, as well as Latin and, uh, and, and a number of other languages as well that he had had to have. So he made a real name for himself in the area, and he was known throughout the region, not just in that one particular church. The area which they're involved in is, is, is literally in the center of the map. The state of, these are Mexican states after independence, and the, you see the yellow state of Querétaro, where the city of Querétaro is, <laughs> in the center. And just to its left is the state of Guanajuato. And so most of the events that we're talking about occur between those two places. Uh, Dolores uh, uh, would be, the town of Dolores would be about where the letter um, um, J is in Guanajuato or so, maybe a little bit further above. It's a little bit above that, but it's in that same general area. And of course, also nearby is the town of San Miguel El Grande, which is today is San Miguel de Allende, where again, where I spent a, a, a good part of the last two summers. So if this is in an area of Mexico known as El Bahio, um, uh, sort of the center of Spanish settlement in Mexico, and, but also the center of silver mining activity. All of most of the states you see to the north are involved in silver production. And Mexico was producing at this time so much silver, in fact, that Mexican uh, silver uh, a coin, which is the dollar, was so common that it was more common in the American colonies to use Spanish money than it was to use English money. So when we came time for our country to choose its currency, we picked the Spanish mill dollar. And you know the story, that they, it was, there was so much of it and there was so little money that they cut it into pieces, into eight pieces, pieces of eight. And that we still call a quarter two bits, two, two of those pieces, and four bits for a 50, these are at least old terms that maybe some of you have heard. Two bits to stand for a quarter, four bits for 50 cents. But it comes because Spanish dollars were, they were the world currency used from China to Europe, and including of course in the Americas. Now the plan of the conspirators, what was it that they hoped to achieve? Uh, the plan was primarily to uh, start the insurrection, the revolution will begin on October 1st, thank you. And um, this is uh, Ignacio de Allende. Nobody really has a real picture of him from life. These were all made after his life, what he should have looked like, I guess. They knew he had long sideburns. So, but the insurgents were, the forces were supposed to be a Creole trained and disciplined army. Of course, in most of Latin America, the soldiers have almost always been either African Americans of one kind or Indians. They were often just swooped up in, in, in most of Mexico's or Argentina's or Chile's or, or uh, Costa Rica's or Venezuela's wars. Almost all of the foot soldiers have always been either Indians or blacks or uh, people of mixed heritage. And the Spanish are never really fighting as foot soldiers. So the Creoles figured like Allende that they would create an army and they would then have a peaceful transition of power. They had this in mind because that is what had just happened in Argentina in May 1810. The Creoles there, who had established some um, um, credibility because they had actually defeated the English when the English sent a force down, they had actually defeated them twice, uh, had simply taken over and forced the, the Peninsular Spanish from power. And so the Creoles in Mexico and Querétaro figured we could do the same thing. We'll, they'll, just be, they'll just step aside and we'll move into the positions of power. What they wanted was for everything else to stay the same, which meant that those at the bottom would stay at the bottom and nothing would be for them, nothing for the poor, nothing for the Indians. It, they would now have all the benefits of the privileges of, of the best lands. They already were rich and they had lands, but they just didn't have the, the positions that they could make money and get status in society. So that's what the plan was. Of course, the plan didn't act, happen like that, as you saw in the video uh, break here. The conspiracy was betrayed. 
Now this is the Cabildo or the Royal, this would be the, uh, the official city building in uh, Queretaro, even today. And it's a, I think they call this Constitution Plaza there. And there's a, a, a replica of, uh, of, of a bell. I think their bell's been taken to the museum in Mexico City. But this is the building where the Corregidor, Dominguez, and his wife, uh, Maria Josefa, uh, lived. And they lived in the upper rooms. And of course, the lower rooms would have been the office buildings for the various kinds of services that they had. Well, anyway, they had a conspiracy. And the problem with conspiracies is there were a lot of people coming and going. It was based on um, a literary society that they had, and they invited people to come in and talk. And so unfortunately, so many people came and went that there was a lot of talking outside about what are they doing over there in the Cabildo? They're talking about overthrowing the Spanish government. And the word eventually leaked to just about every royal official in the region they knew about it. Well, eventually, one of the guys said it's going to begin on October 1st, and so the word came down from Mexico City to squash it. And so local officials then went to the Corregidor. They knew his wife was involved. They didn't know he was involved. And so the Corregidor has got to hide his position and say, oh, I've just discovered, that, there, like in Casablanca, that there's gambling going on here. And then he takes his winnings and walks out. But no, he's supposed to go and arrest everybody. And so he, he says, OK, I'll do, let's go out and investigate. So he locks his wife in the rooms and doesn't allow her to go out. This is her moment in history coming up right here, this locked room. And so um, he then goes out and he finds, you know, they, they go to places and he says, they, he walks in and says, well, there's nothing here and walks out and they go in and find that they're, they're, they're caching arms there. They're, they're making gunpowder. They're stacking weapons ready for the, the, the revolution to begin. And so he eventually is arrested. Uh, she is very frustrated. She realizes that they're going to go out and get the other conspirators. They're going to go on to San Miguel and get Allende and uh, the other captain, Aldama, and then they're going to go to and get Father uh, Hidalgo in Queretaro, or in uh, uh, Dolores. So she sends a message, and she apparently the, I saw in a, in a recent uh, novela that was done of this, um, where she's stomping on the floor to try to get the, the, uh, the one of the city officials below. Apparently they had, had set up some sort of system. He was in on the conspiracy too, and she stomped on the floor and got his attention and then she passed a note to him through the key to the lock, the keyhole in the lock. And of course this brings us to Maria Josefa Ortiz de Dominguez. And in the cartoon version, you can see she's quite attractive. And in the, in the, in the lifetime bust made on the right, you can see more of what she really looked like. <laughs> Apparently, both she and her mother had a beard, Ooh, uh, as reported by people who had actually seen them. Uh, but she is a true, I mean, she basically put her life and her position on the line to warn the fellow conspirators. Uh, why would a person like this have been involved? She was she had a pure Spanish background, very proud of that, but she felt that she that she and her fellow Creoles had just been trampled on their rights and their dignities had been trampled so many times that she wasn't going to put up with it. So she gets the message through, and of course in the in the museum they still have the uh, the keyhole is still there, and it's been preserved. Um, we, they tell us it's the keyhole. So it's much like you, you got to take a, do this with a little bit of faith. And this was her messenger, one, the, the other official. And he's remembered on this hillside. And fortunately, they had the sun behind it. I'm not very good at photography. And it's a statue of him saying, this way to San Miguel, I guess. And um, she is also buried there in this elaborate tomb. Uh, she was arrested and she was put into a series of convents during the independence movement and eventually let out when it was all over and then she was awarded all kinds of honors but she refused to take them. And she refused to any kind of money award or anything like that. She was just doing what she thought was right. So she is like the greatest hero of Corregidor has, I mean the uh, Queretaro has ever produced and she's considered the great hero of the town there. Uh, Ignacio de Allende, or Ignacio Allende, was from San Miguel el Grande, and there's a picture of San Miguel de Allende down below. And there's a series of these great portraits of him with swords and stuff. And the interesting thing about this is that he disagreed with just about everything Hidalgo did, but we don't want to remember that. We think of him as the, one of the co-insurgentes um, or insurgents, but he was fighting Hidalgo from the beginning because he was just appalled by what he was doing. But he's the one who got the message from the Corregidora, and then he carried it on and got to uh, Dolores on, would be this evening at about 8 or 9 o'clock. So he got there in the evening of the 15th, and he then went to the, the house, and uh, apparently Hidalgo wasn't there because he was out playing cards with some local Spanish people, people that he would lock up just a few hours later. And uh, so much for, for having him as a friend. 
and he went, they, uh, uh, after they had raised um, the uh, other conspirators in the area, and, he, and Allende had sent out messages to some of the local soldiers who were stationed nearby, they convened at this church, uh, which is the church where Hidalgo was the parish priest. And this is, uh, this is a center of a lot of celebration that would be, will happen tomorrow. Uh, and so, th then at, not at the, on the 15th, but instead on the 16th, again, sometime in the morning, uh, as some sources say as late as 8 o'clock, some say as early as 4 o'clock. It was, it was a good day to give the grito or the cry, as it's called, because it was market day. And there were a lot of people in town for the market, and so it was full of people. All night long, they had seen people coming and going, and, and the word had sort of spread, go get your equipment, go get your, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, defend ourselves. And so a lot of the local people, remember, who are Indians and Costas, they went and got what weapons they had, thinking that there might be an invasion or something going on. And so most of their weapons and stuff would be clubs and slingshots and farm equi equipment things like uh, small knives and so on and, and, and pruning shears and those kinds. They didn't have a whole lot of guns. And so they all came down to the steps of the church where Hidalgo gave his famous cry. Now, the, um, the cry is not necessarily the scream, although there's a copy of the scream on there. But what did he actually say? Again, nobody really knows. We do know that he said, he wound up saying death to the Spanish, even though he himself, of course, is Spanish. Death to the Gachupines. He sa also said uh, that uh, long live good religion. That it, he, he basically told them a story and said that the, the uh, Spanish government is in the hands of the French and they're gonna corrupt your faith. And so to save it from those evil atheistic French, sorry John, those evil atheistic French, you've got to come out and we've got to save the faith. And long live the Virgin of Guadalupe, by the way. Uh, and so he, he said all of these things and he talked about independence. He got everybody fired up. They were already pretty anxious anyway. And um, he didn't speak with, he didn't have the banner of the Virgin of Guadalupe yet, but so these pictures that show him with the banner, he hadn't actually grabbed it on the way yet. So that's the Grito, and that's what they reenact every midnight in Mexico City on the main square when the president of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of Mexico comes out on the balcony of the National Palace and rings the exact same bell that was the bell for this church. Hidalgo's bell, and he gives the cry, and he'll say, Viva Independencia, Viva Hidalgo, and he goes through all the revolutionary, or the independence heroes, the insurgentes, Viva Morelos, Viva Guerrero, Viva Bravo, and so on and so on and so on. He'll go through the names of all of them tonight. Uh, and so again, that's what to be looking for, is he lists the names of Allende and, and the others. This is what's posted right there, and, and it's on this location. I think the term, it means that they, they mustered or brought them together the, the, by the father, the father of the country, the reunited people at this porch or atrium on the morning of the 16th of September, 1810. In uh, uh, Dolores today, this is an extra, extra picture, it got in, so much for editing, that shows the statue of him on, in, right in front of his church. And this is a great little park. Has anybody been to Dolores? They sell shrimp ice cream there. Ooh. I know. It's one of those things that you gotta try. It, it sounds horrible, tastes pretty good, actually. Yeah. Hidalgo's cry, though, did something that it was not intended to do. It started a class war, or social war. By, by blaming the Spanish for this, he got them all, the people all inflamed. And this was not what the plan was all about, remember, which was to wait until October and train some people. Instead, he, they, they got the common people all fired up. Now, first of all, they were so mad at the Spanish, they didn't distinguish between the Creole Spanish and the Peninsular Spanish. They went after all Spanish people, and they started raiding their homes. Hidalgo, literally, the people tore into the homes of his friends, and they came to him and said, how can you do this? We were just playing cards a few hours ago, and he just says, put them in jail. And when they marched off, they put all the local Spanish on donkeys so that everybody would know that they were being humiliated. And, and here's a guy, again, who lived among, the, he had not lived in any different way from any of the Spanish, but he, this is a famous man of fire uh, in Guadalajara, this painting, because he literally started a fire that he hadn't planned on starting. Uh, when Allende and others said, you can't do this, you can't arm a mob to do this, he said, the people have a right to, you know, they've been treated so badly, they can loot, they can burn, they can steal, they have a right to do it. 
That's not something we generally want our heroes to go around saying. <laughs> but those kinds of things are, are swept under the carpet, of course, when they want to remember Hidalgo. And what happened was that it, it brought some general uni, uh, unanimity among all the Spanish to oppose him. Now, this, is, this was mentioned in that little video brief about the Alondiga de Granaditas. This is a granary, a solidly built building in the, the town of Guanajuato, a beautiful, that beautiful mining town which is in a, a gorge. And this building still exists. And the, all of the Spanish in town, Creole and Peninsular, huddled with their families in there. And of course, many of them brought in all the gold and silver that they could too. You know, they, they were, and they left all the people outside that weren't Spanish. Now, they were very angry about this, you know, because Hidalgo's army is on the march, and they'd stopped nearby San Miguel and picked up a, a painting of the Virgin of Guadalupe, which they turned into a flag, which is still kept in the National Museum, which as you see in some of the pictures of Hidalgo. They marched on to San Miguel, they took the town, looted a bunch of homes there until Allende beat them on with a sword, they were his neighbors, and then they marched on to Guanajuato, and here, by, by this time, the story had gotten so, so the, the, what they were really up with, this is a social revolution. This is not about saving the Creoles from the peninsulars. This is about saving your lives. And they got into this building and they figured that it would be strong enough that they could defend it with their troops. Well, what happened was, and this again goes into um, to history. Does anybody know the name of the character in the lower right-hand corner? He, he's, a, he's a hero in central Mexico and his, his portrait, I mean, his statues are everywhere. He's known as El Pipala, which basically kind of the translation is like Tom Turkey. You know, it's, it's, it's like Turkey Tom would be like, it's kind of like a nickname. And he was a miner who worked in one of the mines nearby and he was among the people that were being left outside to whatever was gonna happen to them by the Spanish. And so these people joined Hidalgo's forces and very soon he had thousands and thousands and thousands of people and they tried to get the Spanish to uh, surrender here at, at the Alhondiga, and they were fighting them off, and so what he did is he crawled forward with this stone on his back to deflect the bullets, and basically uh, poured some oil on the door. Some people say he blew it up, but he actually set it on fire. And that broke the door down, and they got in, they massacred all the men, women, and children inside. So as they say, they took the bloody battle of the Alhondiga, but they don't mention that everybody was massacred on the inside. And so, I mean, this, this is an important, this is actually like the high point of the insurgency movement of Hidalgo was the capture of the Alhondiga. And uh, it was, uh, it basically scared every other Spaniard in the, re in the New Spain to, you know, not be lukewarm in, op in opposing this. It was like, this is what's gonna happen to you if they come to your town. And it, why did it happen? Because it was out of control. He could not control the mob. He was picking people, you know, people who might have been rascals of some kind or criminals or so on, and he was making them into generals and so on. So this is a giant monument to the people that is up there, is, is at Guanajuato. You can see the, with some of the people that overlooks the city. And he's such a great hero. Of course, as it pointed out, he was, they were, they captured Guadalajara, but then they were defeated. He had a great opportunity to capture Mexico City, but for some reason he turned around. We don't know whether it was his conscience. He realized there would be a bloodbath if they ever reached Mexico City. And that, of course, was led to his defeat because many of the people left him as he had not moved on to really overthrow the government. They marched to the north and again they were betrayed by people in Coahuila, which is just south of Texas. And this shows Allende and, and uh, Hidalgo being captured by royalist forces. He was taken to the city of Chihuahua in northern Mexico where he was first stripped of his, because, because priests could not be tried by civil courts. He had to be first taken before the Inquisition and stripped of his, of his priest, priesthood. And uh, then he was turned over to royal authorities and they shot him and they um, cut his head off. They put his head in a cage, as, along with Allende's and, Al, and Aldama's, and they took them back to the Alhondiga and they hung them on hooks on the corners of those buildings where they stayed until 1821 when they were finally taken down. Uh, whatever body parts of theirs that are still around, I guess the rest of his body was buried in Chihuahua. There's an interesting museum to the, uh, to the independence in Chihuahua if you ever get there. They took the rest of the body parts after, long after Mexico uh, achieved independence and they buried them in the angel column, which I'll show you a picture here in just a second. For the celebration this week, they've taken them out and they've been touring the bones around the country of the 12 insurgents that they knew that were in there and they discovered they had 14 bodies. 
So they don't know who the other two are. <laughs> and apparently they said that, that they thought people would be very patriotic seeing the bones and the skulls of, the, of these leaders of the independence movement. In fact, people have been very depressed because they've been seeing a lot of bodies in the news in Mexico lately. So it's kind of had a, a different effect than the one that they thought. The real hero, and I wish we had more time to talk about him because I will talk about him next year. And this is uh, Jose Morelos, Jose Maria Morelos y Pavón. And you can see him as sort of Super Morelos in the cartoon character on the right. I guess in that cartoon that's coming out in a, in a couple of weeks. And they actually have him. He's a, he was a short guy. He was a, a true mixed cast, part black, in fact, as well. But he's often portrayed by white, uh, as white by, by white writers and, and by Indians and blacks by others. <laughs> He certainly does not look uh, black in the position on the right. The, um, but he's the true hero that brought the, the independence to uh, fruition by working to create a Congress and suggesting that we need to have true racial equality. Hidalgo had never said that, but Morelos pushed it. And so he's really the father of, of modern Mexico in many ways. And they named a state out of, after him. And of course, the capital of um, of uh, Michoacan is named after him as well. The person who really achieved independence and, and not remembered as the father of his country is Agustin Iturbide, who was a royalist general, and he switched sides. Now, why would he do that? Again, they showed in the video, when Spain went liberal, in other words, by saying that they're going to they're going to uh, tolerate uh, other faiths besides Catholicism, when they're going to take away privileges of the of the uh, Peninsular Spanish, the Peninsulars all switched sides suddenly. Well, we want to be independent, and why was that? Because they wanted to preserve their rights. So what happened was he and Vicente Guerrero came together, as they said, on the third of, or the first of March, 1821. They proclaimed the, the they were the Army of the Three Guarantees, which you see in the flag, uh, Union, Religion, and uh, Independence, which become the three colors of the Mexican flag. The religion, of course, is Catholicism, the white part, and he basically became the father of Mexican independence. Although, of course, Hidalgo is the one that they want to remember. And so it's a convoluted story. We'll get to the rest of it as we, as we uh, uh, remember these years and the next few years. But t today and tomorrow, we are remembering the beginning of independence. And uh, unless anybody has any questions, that's it.